Thank you. And we'll take our first questions from Louise Green with MMA Crazy. Your line is open. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. Um, obviously, this is your second time out to Fight Island. Can you talk a little bit about the first time, how that experience was for you? Obviously, um, getting ready to be a backup for Khabib and Gaethje and then compared to this time round when you actually have a fight scheduled. Yeah, that first the first trip out here to Abu Dhabi was uh, was definitely a good one. I, I knew and I knew that I knew there was always a slim chance that, you know, uh, I was going to fight on Fight Island in October. Um, there would have been a really ser a series of events that would have involved a lot of bad luck for me to end up fighting, you know. Um, so we really didn't want that for anybody. Um, but I wanted to take that opportunity to prove to the UFC right away that I was going to say yes to a lot of opportunities. And uh, the first time, you know, I was just talking to uh, someone else too. It's you, you got to deal with the time change. You got to deal with all that stuff. This time is a little bit different because there is kind of the pressure of the fight, but then there's also more of the excitement and the motivation knowing that I do have a fight as well. Last time was actually a little bit tougher because I knew I probably wasn't going to fight and I still had to make 155 pounds, which is always the hardest part. The fighting part is the easy part. The making weight is is the toughest part for me. Um, but now I uh, now I see familiar faces that I saw on Fight Island a couple, couple months ago. Um, starting to get to, to know my new colleagues, the, the people I'm going to be rubbing elbows with for the next couple of years, for the for the remainder of my career. So um, I'm excited to to continue with this fight week, make make weight, and then finally have my UFC debut on Saturday night. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, obviously, this is a it's a highly anticipated pay per view card. Obviously, it's the first one of the year, uh, and and of course, you have the added factor of it being headlined by Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier. What are your thoughts on making your UFC debut on this card? I think you couldn't have scripted it any better um, for the first chapter of my of my UFC career. Obviously, uh, I came over as a as a pretty big signing, and uh, the fans wanted me to fight right away. And then I had the kind of the backup opportunity. So it seems like it's been somewhat of a a longer process than it actually has been because of of it's hit the headlines so much. Um, but to be the co-main event on the what could be the biggest card of the year for the first fight, my first fight in the UFC and fighting a top five opponent, a, a perennial uh, top top lightweight in Dan Hooker, a guy who's going to bring it, a guy who's going to, um, you know, it, this, this fight's got fight of the night written all over it. Um, so that brings a lot of hype. And then the only thing bigger than being the co-main event on a Conor McGregor pay-per-view is actually being in the cage with Conor McGregor on a pay-per-view. So um, when things go well on Saturday night, um, that could be that. That could be what's next, and I could check off both of those boxes in in 2021. But uh, humbled by the opportunity, feel great that the UFC wants to put me in this kind of position. Um, I'm here to I'm here to stay, and I'm here to here to get that gold. So um, the first step in that quest starts Saturday night on a very very big pay per view with a lot of eyeballs and the perfect entrance into the UFC. Yeah, and like you said, obviously a lot of eyeballs because it is your UFC debut and there's a lot of, you know, expectations. Um, how do you stay focused? Do you feel the pressure because of that? And and obviously with the added factor of, you know, Khabib saying he wants to see something spectacular for him to want to come out of retirement. How do you deal with the pressure and are you feeling extra pressure because of those? Uh, no, not really. I, uh, I know 100% certainly that I that this card is much much bigger exponentially bigger than it actually is inside my mind I've I've tried to compartmentalize it and shrink it down into it just being another another fight because truly at the end of at the end of the day that octagon door is going to close there's a set of rules and we have minimal equipment and we have 15 minutes to go out there and compete just like I've done 26 times in, in my career it's it's still the exact same thing it's the exact same sport nothing is different if you don't let those outside circumstances those outside pressures get to you um because those are only going to hinder my performances um as far as khabib you know saying that he may may come back if he sees something spectacular i expect myself to be spectacular every single time i perform anyway so um Spectacular is always what I'm going for. So there is no added pressure when it comes um, to Khabib's statements. I do know I want to go out there, do my job. I do want to be spectacular. Um, and I would love to fight Khabib, but 
by the end of 2021. Um, but Habib is the greatest lightweight of all time. He has cemented his legacy as as the greatest to ever do it. So he has reserved the right to sail off into the sunset and never have to fight again. Uh, or if he feels that itch to come back, why shouldn't it be me? So with a win over Hooker on Saturday, what would be the perfect scenario for you next? You know, I just got to ask that because as I said, okay, so you go out, you dominate Hooker, you got two options. Connor wants to fight you or Habib wants to fight you. Which one do you choose? And I said, man, that's probably the toughest decision, the the thickest conundrum that you can be in in the sport of mixed martial arts to have the gold uh, staring at you and the greatest lightweight of all time, the undefeated um, undefeated guy in, in Habib, the greatest test of your career. And then you have Connor, the biggest name, the biggest hype, probably the most money, um, all of those different outside circumstances. And I always say, I always go to the gold. I always go to the championship. I would forego, forego more money. I would forego more notoriety, more celebrity, more hype to have the opportunity to fight for that gold. Um, but we, uh, you know, we shall see what happens. And, uh, I don't know. All I know is we. This is the biggest promotion in the world, and Dana White knows how to run a phenomenal promotion. He he's going to put together the right fights. Habib obviously has a say in who he wants to fight. Connor has a say in who he wants to fight. So there's a lot of moving parts, as you guys have seen in the media. Um, it hitting the headlines that I was supposed to fight Gaethje or Oliveira or Hooker, and then Gaethje again, and then it just kind of went back and forth and back and forth. There's a lot of outside circumstances that are out of my control as a competitor. Um, so we will see the cards will fall where they may. Uh, all I know is I got to go out there and do my job on Saturday night. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. We'll go next to Sumik Dada with sports Kita. Your line is open. Hey, Michael, good to see you. And I hope you're doing well. Yes, you too. Thank you. So, uh, finally your debut week is here and right off the bat, could you describe what the feeling is in your mind, knowing that you'll finally be competing inside that UFC octagon? I think it's uh, just gratitude. You know, I've uh, I've been fighting outside the UFC for for a long time. Um, I've dreamed of this moment for a long time, and when I dreamt of it, I dreamt about the pressure that was going to come along with it. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't really feel it. You know, I don't feel the pressure. I really don't. Um, I feel like I'm in a win-win situation. I feel like the stage is set for me to go out there and capture everything I've ever wanted. I feel like the 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 blank page is ready for me to just write the first chapter in this in this story of of me coming to the UFC and what the rest of my career is going to look like. Um, I'm ready to ready to paint a masterpiece on where I need to be physically, where I need to be mentally, where I need to be spiritually. Um, I love the experience so far. I love the platform. I love the notoriety. I love the I love the process. I love everybody here at the UFC. Um, every, the process is going really, really well, and I'm really enjoying it. And, uh, you know, talk to me. If you talk to me in 48 hours from now when I'm cutting weight, I'm 155 pounds, 156 pounds. It might be a little bit different, um, but I'm really enjoying the process thus far and ready to go out there and paint a masterpiece. <clears throat> now, uh, speaking of your debut, your first opponent, Dan Hooker, has been quite a, he's, he's been on quite a run in the lightweight division. His last fight ended in a loss, but that was a five-round war against Justin Poirier. Now, I don't want to get into game planning, but what do you think makes Dan a dangerous opponent, and how do you plan on dealing with his pace? I think Dan, Dan's got one of the biggest hearts in the division. I think he uh, he's probably one of the hungriest guys in the division. All you know, This is a murderer's row. This is, this is the biggest shark tank that the UFC has, has ever uh, come, coming up with when it comes to a division. The lightweight division... Um, is probably the thickest and in and, and the most deep in the, the the deepest in the in the promotion and right right there you got dan hooker with the, probably one of the biggest hearts and uh the guy who who knows how to knows how to dish out damage he knows he can take damage um he's got all the phys physical attributes to be a champion um he's got all the skill sets to be a champion so um i've prepared I have left no stone unturned in in preparation, in game planning, where I need to be, and uh, he poses a lot of threats. A lot, you know, maybe more threats than some of the other guys that were that were on the short list of guys that I was maybe going to have to fight in my debut. But that's what excites me. That's what gets me gets me excited. I haven't been an underdog since 2011. Um, this is the first time I will be plus money. Um, 
and it all makes sense. You know, it's my UFC debut. I got to go out there and prove it. I got to go out there and earn it. And uh, you put me in a scenario where I got to go out and earn something and prove, prove, uh, prove something. Um, that's a recipe for success for me. I've had to do it my entire life and this is no different. Now, <clears throat> now you've made it quite clear that the UFC lightweight division is one of the deepest divisions right now. I'm sure you're willing to fight all the top guys in the division, but I'm also curious, have you taken note of the guys outside of the top six, maybe, you know, uh, like the likes of Paul Felder, Ali Quinta, and former champion like Rafael Dos Anjos? And if so, is there anyone who's gotten your attention so far? Of course. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm a fan as well. You know, I, uh, I study fights. I watch fights. I, I buy the pay-per-views. I, I sit at home and, and with my wife and we, we enjoy the fights. So um, I'm always interested in the lightweight division. A lot of those names that you said are, are names that I've had my eye on for, for a long time, fighting outside the UFC and now inside the UFC. Um, listen, I, I think, uh, I think I got my eye, my eyes set on beating Dan Hooker and then only going up, um, towards number one after that. But of course, um, everybody in that top 10 is a guy who is one win away from being thrust into the top five, one win away from, from becoming a contender. So you got to keep your eye on all of them. And, uh, Paul Felder, I, I'm a fan of his style. Um, Ally Quinta is actually a guy that I've trained with before. I'm a fan of his style. Dos Anjos, as you said, former champion. Um, these guys are all great, you know, um, and I'm the kind of guy who, who has always operated with the thought that it's okay to give, give props to your fellow competitors because it's not going to help you win or help you lose whether or not you give your competitors props. Um, when I see talent, when I see skill, um, I call it out. And pretty much every single guy in the top 10 is, is, a, uh, is an extremely skilled fighter. And I'm excited to throw my name right in the mix. No, of course, uh, this will be your big debut. Everyone's been waiting for Michael Chandler to finally step into the octagon. And it's going to happen this weekend. But now with what Dana White said regarding Khabib's announcement over the weekend, do you feel that adds an extra bit of pressure? Or do you like feel that you have to prove the champion, prove a point to the champion? Um, no, I don't feel the pressure to do, you know, to do anything spectacular, as he said, because uh, spectacular is what I'm always aiming at. That is always the bullseye that I'm aiming at every single time I step in into um, the cage. Uh, I start fast. I want to get a finish. I've got a lot of finishes on my record. Win, lose, or draw, I'm always exciting. And a lot of times my fight style ends in a finish. So uh, that's what I'm going to be looking for. Hopefully I end it quick um, because the quicker the quicker it is, the more spectacular it will be and uh, the more enticing a fight with me may be to Khabib. So uh, the main event for this weekend between Justin Poirier and Conor McGregor is already one of the most talks, talked fights of, talk fights of the year. Now, Justin, Justin mentioned that he wants to get a war against Conor McGregor. Conor mentions that he'll get a KO inside 60 seconds. You being a veteran, do you feel Dustin is approaching this fight with the right mindset, or how do you see it playing out? I do because if you if you know anything about Dustin Poirier, you know that he thrives in in the battle. Uh, he he relishes the challenge the challenge of of being in the deep waters of being being uh, being cut up and bleeding and 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 uh, beaten down because that's where where he pulls something out of himself and becomes that champion that is Dustin Poirier. Um, Connor has got some of the most precise, most powerful hands in the division. He can put away anybody um, with the right punch. So in the first two rounds, if Dustin can evade that, evade that left hand, um, we're going to see uh, a very interesting fight late in the second, third, fourth, and fifth round. I think that's where Dustin Poirier can take over um, if the fight continues in that direction. So we'll see. Either uh, I think either of those scenarios could be probable. Um, either way, they're both going to be entertaining, and I'm going to get my win. I'm going to shower up real quick, do my quick media, and hopefully be out to watch the main event and possibly watch my next opponent. And last one from me. Now, you've mentioned in the past you're not here for a long time, but for a good time. That being said, is there perhaps a feeling that you could have or should have come to the UFC earlier in your career, or do you feel everything has happened at the right time for you? No, I think it it all came at the right time, and I and I told Dana that when I was on the phone with him right before I, I signed that, you know, six years ago, four years ago, two years ago, each time my contract ended, um, 
I was not ready mentally, physically, and spiritually to be the to be the champion, to be the superstar that you need um, for your organization, the superstar that you deserve. When I told him that, I believed it. I believed it in my heart. I saw it in my mind. And uh, I believe that today. I think that's just as true today as it was that day that I signed. I believe this Saturday is the first chapter in me um, having the best performance of my life. I, I perform the best whenever the pressure is on, whenever the lights are brightest, whenever the stage is is the biggest. So um, can't ask for bigger than, than UFC 257 live on pay-per-view as the co-main event. And uh, – I'm excited about it, and uh, I think it's a perfect time out there to take what's mine. Well, I wish you all the best, and thank you for your time, sir. You got it. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll go next to Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Michael, you've been part of some big fights before. Is there any fight that you can compare to, you know, the fight week would feel up to the level of this one? No, not even close. <laughs> you know, this is, this is huge. Um, as I was saying earlier, the only thing, um, the only thing bigger than being on the co-main event of a Conor McGregor, McGregor card is being in the main event with him. So um, you're literally one degree of separation away from um, kind of the biggest stage of uh in mixed martial arts so to be the co-main event to be the guy who uh every every eyeball in the mixed martial arts world seemingly every eyeball in the world will be watching the co-main event that leads right up to conor mcgregor versus dustin poirier so to be in this situation to be in this platform it's uh it's the biggest i could have ever dreamed of and uh you know i will say the feeling of it doesn't feel as big as it actually is because I've compartmentalized it. I've suppressed the feelings. I've watered down the feelings and the emotions because the last thing I want to do is let my emotions get the best of me. I want to stay even keel. I want to stay focused. I want to stay where I need to be mentally uh, and spiritually for this entire week uh, to be able to go out and put myself in the best situation possible to be successful on Saturday night. You touched on it a bit, but I was curious. Um, on Saturday, there was obviously so much attention on the Habib announcement and all this stuff. You're a guy who's right here in the mix. At this point, like, are you invested in, you know, the storyline, will he or won't he come back? Or are you kind of over it and it's like, you know what, whoever they put in front of me, let's just get it, you know, because at the end of the day, you're obviously worried about your career first and foremost. Yeah, you always got to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing for me is my career, my matchups, my whoever signs on the dotted line, whoever steps in that, that octagon with me, because this is a what have you done for me lately business, and you're only as good as your last fight. So I have to do my job uh, on Saturday night. And if I don't do my job on Saturday night, what Connor's doing and Poirier are doing doesn't matter. What Khabib's doing doesn't matter. What anybody is doing doesn't matter if I don't go out there and do my job. So first and foremost, I got to go do my job and focus on uh, the main thing. But uh, I'm invested in it. Um, he, Khabib is the greatest of all time. He's the best lightweight on the planet. He's undefeated. He looks on un, he's looked unbeatable 96% of his career. Um, so everyone's interested in what he's doing. Um, I'm interested in what he's doing. I didn't deserve to fight Habib right when I came in anyway, necessarily. Um, so I knew I was going to have to get a win. So I was at least one fight away, if not two fights away from getting that title shot. I think with a spectacular win on, on Saturday night, I could get the title shot. Um, but it remains to be seen how this fight ends. So uh, I'm invested, but not too invested. I'm invested in, in, in Saturday night and me going out there and, and finishing Dan Hooker. It feels like there were so many, you know, um, rumored fights circulating, you know, throughout uh, coming up to your debut, the backup, and then where you're going to fight Tony, where they're going to try to get maybe Dustin to fight you and all this. Um, obviously, you know, there's the fight and the training, but there's also big business. What would you say is the most difficult part about being a businessman in the fight game? Um, I mean, for me... I was actually kind of on the other side of the other guy. You know, I was on the other side while the other guys were making business decisions. I, I think it wasn't a very good business decision for these guys to take a fight against me. The guy who uh, was coming from another organization, an organization not as big as the UFC, 
Um, I do have wins over two former UFC champions. Um, I do have a great record. I do have an exciting fight style. The hardcore fans know exactly who I am, and and the hardcore fans, quite frankly, um, know that I deserve to be in this the top of this lightweight division. So, um, but to the average to the average guy, or even to these guys in the in the UFC, nobody wanted to be the first guy to to dip their toe in the water and uh, and challenge me. So I commend Dan Hooker for for stepping up and saying yes. Um, and I think it's uh, you know Dana White, Sean Shelby these guys trying to make these fights happen. And there's so many different outside circumstances, whether it be business or whether it be pleasure, you know, whether these guys just want more time off or whether they just simply don't want, didn't want to fight me. It was an interesting experience, but uh, it all shook out and, and landed where it needed to land. And we're a couple of days away from my debut, Dan Hooker, January 23rd. Hey, thank you, Michael, and good luck. Thank you. We'll go next to Cote Cruz with Ford Win MMA. Your line is open. Hey, Michael. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good to talk to you again. Yes, um, sir. On Thursday, you'll experience your first press conference like mm -hmm. there used to be before the pandemic. Uh, Dane and the rest of the guys sitting there in a bit of a free-for-all in terms of uh, chances of trash talk. Uh, what do you think you'll do if you get in some verbal sparring with any of the other participants? Uh, do what I've always done. Um, keep it respectful, but also uh, throw a little wittiness in there. You know, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it uh, how it all unfolds. I mean, um, to me, a press conference it, it's it's an entertainment thing. It's more for the fans. It's more for the media. Um, there's nothing I can say or do at the press conference that's going to help me beat Dan Hooker on Saturday night um, or help me jockey for for position <clears throat> in a fight against Connor or, or Poirier or or Habib or whatnot. So. Um, we'll see, you know, it's, I will say, I was delighted to hear there's going to be fans there. Um, delighted to hear that it's going to be, uh, me and hooker as well as Connor and Poirier. And it's just us four. So the pool of questions will be whittled down to just us four. So I should be getting some questions. Um, and, uh, it's my first UFC press conference and there's fans. So it's a, it's a good time. Yeah, I was going to say that you, your perfect timing about the fans coming back. How do you feel about being able to perform in front of the fans after you had uh, all this situation of the fans being away for so long and now they're here? So you're, you're making your debut in front of a live crowd. Yeah, it's almost been a year, which is crazy to think. Um, so to be fighting on the first card where fans get to come back is a, uh, it's a cool experience, you know, and it's, it's a, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a, you know, somewhat of a historic night. If you think about it, I mean, a, a worldwide pandemic that nobody ever saw coming that basically shuts down all uh, spectator, um, all spectating for the fans inside arenas for almost a year. And now they finally come back at a, at a limited capacity, of course, but, but still a, a, a decent contingent spoke to John Anik the other day. And he said, 2000 fans sounded like, 10,000. Now, granted, maybe that's uh, John's ears being used to not having any fans and they just sounded lo louder and he forgot how how uh, how loud 16,000, 20,000, 30,000 fans sounded. But either way, to feel the energy in the room, the electricity in the room of, of 2,000 fans, a couple thousand fans on a big night, a historic night here on Fight Island is going to be great to be a part of. And I, I'm excited to go out there and perform. Well, speaking of the fight, uh, Dan Hooker said that he feels really comfortable uh, wrestling you. Do you think he really will be? Uh, it remains to be seen. I think uh, I think a lot of guys think that they're comfortable wrestling because they're they're used to wrestling M MMA fighters, but it's different wrestling a MMA fighter who was a wrestler and is a wrestler and still hones the wrestling craft. Uh, compared to just a guy who wrestles one day a week. So the guy who gets into mixed martial arts and doesn't have that wrestling background is much different than a guy who wrestled since he was 14 years old all the way till 24 years old So uh, and competed at the highest level. So um, it remains to be seen. Either way, um, I don't need my wrestling. I don't need to rely on my wrestling fully to beat Dan Hooker. I think I have all the skill set necessary to beat him on the feet, um, to beat him up against the cage, to beat him on the ground, to beat him in every aspect of the game. Um, 
So we'll see how how uh, how it all shakes out. Well, Dan was involved in one of the best fights in 2020 against Saturday's headliner, Dustin Poirier, in which he lost very narrowly. Um, you've had some wars of your own, as we all know. Do you see this fight turning into those into one of those scenarios? Do you welcome that kind of situation or you rather have a more clinical approach to it? Uh, you know, you got you to gotta be willing to embrace the uncertainty of whether or not a war is going to break out. You have to be willing to know that when you when that octagon door closes, that you're willing to get into the firefight, you're willing to get into the deep waters, and you're willing to push yourself past exhaustion uh, into the firefight. Um, obviously, I would love to go out there and knock them out in the first first minute. I would love to put on a a a technical uh, masterpiece. But there's always that that chance that a uh, a brawl is going to break out. I welcome the brawl. I've never shied away from a brawl. I've always had exciting fights, and uh, Saturday night will be no different. I'm I'm willing to fight this fight in any form of fashion that I need to to get my hand raised and uh, come out the victor. Well, sir, I'm excited to see you compete. Bets of luck in your debut. Thank you yes, so sir. much Thank for you. your time. Thank you. And we'll take our final questions from Damon Martin with MMA Fighting. Your line is open. Hey, Michael. Hey, talk before, when we talked before the fight, uh, you, you saw it on Twitter, you Mystic Mike. Uh, you kind of predicted it about the Habib thing. You said, if I have an impressive show, maybe I could entice him back. Uh, but considering he's already said, you know, he has no interest in fighting Connor again, doesn't want to go to that circus. He already beat Dustin. Obviously, Charles Oliveira is out there, but as a former Bellator champion, the guy that has the credentials you have, like in a way, do you feel like you actually do have a bit of the inside track in terms of a guy who who might want to, who might you know entice Khabib to come back? I actually do, which um, kind of sounds like I would be the last guy in the line since I'm the newest guy in the organization, coming from a an organization not as big as the UFC. Um, so I think. Uh, Khabib is a champion in every sense of the word. Um, he he wants the challenge. I think he he's already set financially. He's already set athletically. I mean, there's not much that he can not much more that he can accomplish than 29 and 0. Um, he's looked unbeatable in so many of his fights. Um, he he will have to come back for a new challenge. Connor is not a new challenge. Poirier is not a new challenge. Gaethje is not a new challenge. Oliveira could be a new challenge. Um, but I don't. From all everything that I've heard, it doesn't sound like he's interested in that fight necessarily. Um, although he did say that he looked great a couple weeks ago. But I do think I might have the inside track if I go out there, I do my job, and I look spectacular on Saturday night. Um, we may just see good old fashioned passionate American wrestling versus Dagestani Sambo showdown um, by the end of the year. So uh, I think he relishes in the the seeing me as a new challenge, even though I am the new guy and I haven't quote unquote proven myself in the UFC for a long period of time, getting that first win is the first step to at least saying, Hey, let's, let's try this thing out. Beat me. If you can. Of course, you've been a part of some really big fights. You fought, you know, in Madison Garden, all those kind of things, but the UFC is a different animal. We've seen that a few guys and girls, Coming in their debuts, those those uh, notorious octagon jitters. We hear about that all the time. How have you mentally prepared for that, Michael? You know, dealing with the walkout, dealing with you know, hearing Bruce Buffer call your name for the first time. These are all things we've heard people say. Man, it, it is a different feeling. Uh, how have you mentally prepared for that? I do a lot of visualization. Um, I've made that walk before, cornering guys. Um, obviously, every fight's different. Every arena is different. Uh, you know, I I kind of started to visualize the. Uh, the setup that they had here for the Habib versus Gaethje fight turns out it's completely different because it's going to be at Etihad Arena. Um, so you can never get it all perfectly, but you know, visualizing it, being in that in that octagon, Bruce Buffer saying my name. I've seen it all. I've smelled it all. I've tasted it all. I've felt it all um, already before I actually step into the octagon. Um, and I think I just I bring enough championship level experience to where I'd like to think that. When that octagon door closes, it's the same thing I've done 26 times in my career. And that's a, a limited rule set with limited equipment and uh, a guy in front of me, my weight with two arms and two legs, and we got to compete against each other for 15 minutes. It's all the same. 
Um, the level is higher, the platform is much bigger, but I'm trying to not focus on all the external forces, all the external circumstances of how big this fight is, all the eyeballs that are going to be on me, all the notoriety that comes with being on the co-main event of what will, what seemingly may be the biggest card of the year. So, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, but I'm believing that I'm, I'm not going to feel that pressure come fight night. Uh, I know your team down at Sanford and of great training partners well one guy in particular i know you've worked with a lot and he's mentioned your name this fight is gilbert burns uh gilbert is a guy who has fought dan Hook. i know gilbert and dan are obviously completely different fighters different body styles and things like that but how much of gilbert has gilbert been a part of your camp in terms of getting ready for dan offering you any advice considering he has fought dan hooker yeah uh gilbert brings a wealth of knowledge you know he is a he is a champion in his own right he's fighting for the title here in, in a month or so uh, which I'm really excited about. We've helped each other prepare. Um, we do a lot of uh, workouts with Henry together. So I love watching him and, and then he watches me and, and we kind of pick up stuff from each other. And we've had a couple conversations about their fight. Uh, obviously, Dan Hooker fought a very um, whittled down version of Gilbert Burns. I have no idea how he ever made 155. It's absolutely crazy to me. He's walking around at over 200 pounds. Uh, right now so it's just uh it baffles me that he made 155 so that weight cut took a toll on him um so yeah we, we've talked about some game plan stuff we've talked about um his attributes and uh we believe we have the game plan to be able to go out there and win one for me you know, they always say you don't get a second chance to make your first we've all talked about how big this moment is for you stepping in here but there have been the naysayers. There have been the other fighters in the division that say, oh, this guy's a, a B-level guy, or he's coming in from Bellator. He's not as, as good as UFC. And you deal with fans. Obviously, there's going to be those fans as well. Do you feel like you have something to prove in this fight? I don't think I have anything to prove because I've never uh, – I, I do take those things to heart when they're said, but my performance is not trying to prove anybody right or wrong, you know? Um if anything, I, I'm trying to prove the the believers right. You know, my family, my inner circle, uh, the fans and, and the people that have been with me since day one, prove them right. Whenever they were out there campaigning for me that that I'm one of the best lightweights in the world, even though I wasn't in the UFC, that I could beat Khabib, even though I wasn't in the UFC, that I could beat Connor. There's a lot of people out there who believe in my skill set and believe on the call in the calling on my life. So I'm not there to prove the doubters wrong, uh, but I am there to prove myself my God, my family, my inner circle, and my followers and my fans right uh, that I am one of the best lightweights in the world. And uh, and I get to go out there and prove that. But I don't feel pressure um, because if you're constantly striving for um, proving people right or wrong or uh, striving for the the expectations of others, you're, you're going to put yourself in a, in a, in a jail. And uh, I try not to do that. So I just want to I just want to be free and go out there and perform at my best and uh have a blast, compete hard and get my hand raised. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Damon. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh you're all set. Appreciate you. Thank you.